back to Let's Talk Decarbonisation with me, Matt Stadlin, and I'm delighted to say that our guest today is Philip Selwood. He's the chair of Zemo, Zero Emissions Mobility Organisation, and he also sits on the board of Renewable Energy Association. He's got many other roles as well, and until fairly recently, he was also the CEO of the Energy Saving Trust. A very warm welcome to you, Philip. Hi, Matthew. I just want to start, if I may, really big picture. Given your expertise in the area, where do you feel we are in the climate emergency? Well, the analogy I like to sometimes use is that uh, if we were setting out to climb a mountain, um, say Everest, um, because that's the scale of the challenge, we're, we're, we're beyond base camp but we're certainly no further than Camp 2. So we're in the foothills of this agenda at the moment. This interview is linked to Net Zero Week. How far do we have to go in the UK? We, we have um, to go enormously far in some areas, um, such as transport and the decarbonisation of heat, for instance. Uh, in other areas, like uh, generation, we've made you know great progress on power generation over the last... 15 years or so um, but we're still in a situation with transport for instance where actual transport emissions are still growing compared to 1990 and we've we've got to see uh, somewhere around a 40 percent reduction um, but before 2030. How behaviour change will unlock net zero was a report around this time last year April 2021 it was a report by the Energy Research Partnership. What were the key findings? Well, I think the key findings were um, at the very highest level that we will not reach a net zero future without significant behavioural change. There are many people who think that all we have to do is roll out certain technologies, uh, decentralised heat, heat pumps, solar panels, offshore wind, EV transport, and that's that's the job done. Um, but the reality is, unless we're to see significant behaviour change, not just by households and citizens, but also by businesses and organisations in the public, private and third sector, we will not make that uh, significant change. And I think the other key finding is that if we don't see that significant behaviour change, it will be very difficult to achieve social consent for the for the net zero transition. If I say the words Green Deal to you or Green <laughs> Homes Grant, what's your reaction? My reaction is actually it was a very good idea conceptually, but rather poorly administered. Um, and it was too complex for ordinary people to really get their head round. And the, the two th key things for me um, that that we need to ensure if any policies coming forward like the Green Deal, they've got to be consistent and they've got to be concise um, because if they're not those two things, uh, people won't have faith in them, they won't think they're going to last very long and they won't actually understand the details either. So lots of people said, oh, what a terrible idea, but actually the idea behind Green Deal and many other government policies have been have been quite solid but the execution has actually been quite poor and those criticisms also stand do they for the green homes grant yes i think at the end of the day this was a this was a a scheme that really ought to have um worked quite well but it was it was rushed into service if i can put it that way um it didn't last long enough so there was a deadline set that uh, had to be all wrapped up by uh, the end of the financial year. And of course, that leads to um, people rushing to take advantage of these schemes. And then you find that the supply chain is overwhelmed um, and people, again, lose faith. Um, and if you've got businesses that won't invest in the initiative and if you've got uh, citizens who won't feel confident that they can actually benefit from it, then not surprisingly, it, it hasn't worked. You've already mentioned or alluded to public sector, the private sector. 
How important are partnerships in fighting climate change? Yeah, I, well, I think the first thing to say, whether it's a, a partnership of um, organisations in business, whether it's public private sector, whether it's nation states, um, this crisis um, knows no boundaries. It doesn't know any um, uh, local authority boundaries or regional boundaries or indeed national boundaries. So forging relationships between the private sector and the public sector at every level is absolutely crucial uh, in order to, to pull this off. How good are we at that in the United Kingdom? Well, I think we're, 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 we're pretty good at sec what I would call sector um, coordination. So the Zemo organisation that, that uh, you, you said that I was a chair of, that's a classic example of bringing together uh, big corporates and small, medium-sized enterprises with government departments, government officials and academics uh, all together to solve some fairly um, difficult problems. Um, and I think it's a really good example. It's, it's only one example, but it's a good example of um, introducing, for instance, um, alternative fuels uh, into the marketplace, the drive towards um, electric vehicle transition. These are all being done through partnership working because let's be clear, in the move to net zero, um, there will be losers as well as winners. And therefore, it's absolutely essential that people understand that and accept that um, and work together in order to, to meet that common objective. The government has set out its ambitions for net zero by 2050. How close are we to net zero in the mobility area, in the transport area, which is one of your focuses? Yeah, no, I mean, we're, we're a long way off, Matthew, to be truthful. Um, whether that's in the passenger car market or in the freight market, we're making good progress in some areas. So interestingly enough, we're, we're making good progress in areas like buses. Um, where you've probably seen up and down the country the introduction of either electric or hydrogen fueled buses. Um, and that's been, you know, signally a, a, a serious achievement in terms of urban uh, mobility. But you'll also have seen that that hasn't really had any um, uh, delivery yet in a, in a rural setting. So you've got areas like buses that have worked quite well, but you've got some really difficult uh, areas like heavy goods vehicles, which aren't suitable um, really for uh, battery technology unless they're delivering within cities. Um, so whether it's through uh, gas, whether it's through hydrogen, um, finding solutions for freight is really difficult. And it's not just, as I said at the outset, just about technology. Um, it's about people changing their behaviours. Um, it's uh, uh, an unfortunate fact that you know, we, we will need to make sure that we're investing more heavily in mass transit systems to get people back onto public transport. Um, we've seen uh, after the po pandemic, for instance, just uh, a, a real move away from public transport, which means that uh, emissions from passenger car vehicles for the first time in a number of years are actually going up, not going down. Electric cars have had a, a bit of a bad press very recently. What can we do to make them cheaper, to, to make them more efficient in terms of reliability? So if someone needs to drive, I say need, but if someone chooses to drive hundreds of miles, how can we help persuade them that they are going to be okay on their journey? Yeah, well, first thing to say is that the issue predominantly no longer lies with the vehicle itself. Every time you open uh, you know, a newspaper or every time you look at social media, you see an, uh, one of the large automotive companies launching yet more models uh, available for all sorts of uh, uses for families, for individual um, uh, people wanting to travel you know, city to city. So there are a significant range of vehicles now available to the general public. Um, the big issue uh, that we're facing, and it's certainly uh, an issue that uh, the Electric Vehicle uh, Energy Task Force is, is struggling with at the moment, is to ensure that the infrastructure is rolled out much more quickly um, so that if you, you know, 
having to go from London to Manchester, you shouldn't be feeling any range anxiety because you think, well, I'm not going to be able to top up en route uh, because at the moment, the reality is, is that the infrastructure is neither significant in, number, in numbers and, and too often people are turning up um, and finding the infrastructure is either not working or it's using a different app. So all of those things need resolution. So we need uh, a consistent rollout UK wide uh, of many thousands of uh, it's estimated, uh, you know, depending on who you um, listen to, but anywhere between half a million and 700,000 um, charge points, um, both domestic and also, as you say, on, 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 on mass transit routes. Because what we're not saying, we shouldn't be saying that people shouldn't be travelling. You know, we're social animals. We, we, we need to move about. We've got businesses to run. We've got, you know, relatives to meet. Uh, all of those things. So it's, it's, it's about making that infrastructure uh, more consistent, um, readily available and most of all, reliable. So we need to get very quickly, much more quickly than we are at the moment, perhaps, to a point where charge points for electric vehicles are as easy to access, if not easier to access, than petrol stations. Yeah, I mean, and, and the analogy is right. Um, the, the the difference, of course, is that we, we've got an opportunity um, with electric vehicles to charge at home, which obviously you, you can't do in terms of fossil fuels. But there will be many uh, situations for people um, in domestic properties, flats, uh, streets, where it's not available, charging is not available. So it absolutely has to be um, as, as, as readily available as possible. And I don't know if you've even seen today's press, uh, certainly in, in the Times and other papers today, centre spread uh, about GridServe's latest um, fast charging hub, which is opened in Norwich. Um, I think it's their second or third uh, super hub, as they're calling it. And it's these things, these um, areas and these locations that really will change uh, people's attitude because, they'll, they'll, as you say, they'll just start to see it as everybody's convenient as dropping into your local petrol station and topping up. And just to be clear, how, how advanced are we at the moment on motorways? So if I chose to drive to Scotland instead of taking the train, which would clearly be the better option. But if I chose to drive to Scotland for whatever reason, and would I be equally well served as things stand by electric car charge points as I am by petrol stations? I think my, my answer to that would be, the one difference would be, uh, you would probably have to plan your journey slightly differently, but there's no reason why you can't drive from one end of the country to another using an electric vehicle. Um, but it's true to say that you have to make sure that um, depending on the vehicle you're driving and the infrastructure, that actually, going back to my earlier point, that they are reliable uh, and available and ready to use. But, but there's, are, there's, they, are they available at, at, at the moment? Are they, as they readily, are, they, are they as readily available, these charge points, on motorways as petrol stations? I don't know the answer to this because I, no. I, have, a, I, I have a petrol car. No, no. The, the answer is they are readily available. One of the issues that we're facing is um, their reliability. And that's where people um, like GridServe, as I say, who have opened this, this hub today or this week, um, they're now um, actually in charge of uh, the motorway uh, infrastructure uh, for the UK or certainly for England and Wales. Um, and they're investing, I think, the last number I saw is a billion pounds in ensuring that that motorway network is every bit as uh, as efficient and available um, as as petrol stations currently are. But there's no reason why uh, the combination of a bit of judicious planning um, and thinking ahead means that you can't actually use an electric vehicle. But it's true to say that we just still have not done anywhere near enough in terms of rolling out the infrastructure. What do you mean by reliability then in this context? Well, that's two things. One is um, we, we have a situation at the moment in the UK where um, 
you should be able to uh, you know approach any uh, electric vehicle charging point and be able to pay for it using um, you know a single go cardless type um, application. The reality is is that many of them are uh, proprietary applications, which means that they aren't available to everyone, which is confusing. And I think we've got to overcome that problem. And secondly, there's the issue that some some of the um, infrastructure is is uh, already aging very quickly as a result of being put in, you know, a number of years ago uh, on on motorways, for instance. And too often um, they are not actually operating as effectively as they should be, and some are not operating at all. And I think you know we're seeing lots of feedback uh, about that. But having said that, this is a situation that is improving literally all of the time. Um, my contention is is that we just need to move uh, further and faster in this on this agenda. And what about the greenness of electric cars? How green are they actually? Well, are, are you talking about the car itself or the or the or the uh, how it's how it's fueled? How it's fueled. So obviously, to to build an electric car, just as if you were to build a petrol car, you're going to consume energy in that process. Yes, absolutely. Once you get to the point of use, how green is the energy that they use? The in terms of uh, how how the energy is fueled into the car, it's obviously fundamentally important that that is driven by renewables because if all you're doing is generating electricity through fossil fuels, then you're not really solving the problem. You're only solving half the problem. In terms of the uh, production of the car itself, um, there's been a number, I mean, I mean dozens of studies basically showing that on an end-to-end, a full life cycle basis, from creation through to use to um, uh, recycling at the end of use, that an electric vehicle always is greener than a fossil fuel uh, alternative. I don't think I've seen too many studies uh, suggest otherwise. But like all of these things, it's uh, it's important that um, we, we keep in uh, in mind that, uh, for instance, with the development of battery technology, that we need to b- think of uh, much more sustainable ways of uh, using batteries after, for instance, they have used their effective life in, in an electric vehicle. And there are all sorts of things, models emerging where that can happen. So at a, at a uh, high level, they will always be greener. But can we make them even greener? Yes, of course we can. Isn't the future train travel? Train travel uh, is, there's no question that if you were wanting to drive from you know, London to Glasgow or take the train, um, from an environmental perspective, unfortunately not from an economic perspective currently, because of the price of public transport, uh, from an environmental perspective, there's no question that... Um, taking the train is is absolutely the right uh, alternative. However, and it is a big however, um, we still need to see the mass electrification of certain train um, journeys. We've got still far too many uh, train journeys that are really undertaken, particularly cross-country train journeys, that that frankly uh, are are being taken by, uh, fueled by very, very um, poor environmental diesel Um, and until we see the electrification of those trains then I think uh, whilst it's a better alternative than the car it's still not environmentally terribly clean. Tell us just a little bit more of other areas of interest and impact that you work on as chair of of Zero Emissions Mobility Organisation of CMO. One of the areas that uh, I touched on earlier that we're, we're working so we're not just working with passenger cars, we're working with heavy goods vehicles, we're working with buses. One area that we're recently getting involved in because we've seen it as a significant uh, possibility is um, the development of, if you like, low level, low impact mobility. So we're talking 
scooters, mopeds, um, single cargo delivery vehicles. Um, all of these areas have been pretty much neglected um, and they actually represent some very interesting opportunities, particularly for short journeys. You've probably heard the much quoted statistic that, you know, some somewhere, uh, uh, you know, around 95 percent of, uh, of, of cars are sitting on people's drives and they're only ever five percent in use. Um, and also that 30, I think 35 percent is, is the number of, of um, journeys are taken they're less than three miles. So if you can find ways to encourage people to obviously ideally walk or cycle, but if they're not able, perhaps to use, you know, electrically assisted uh, mobility through mopeds, electric scooters, um, small delivery uh, cargo vehicles, then there's an opportunity to take away a very, very significant number of, of journeys that are currently being made by car or by van. Are, mo are, are mopeds not high emitters? Mo a traditional moped, yes, but actually the, de the development that we're now starting to see of um, electrically assisted, I don't mean just electrically assisted um, bicycles, but electrically assisted um, uh, L, what are called L category um, vehicles, these are the, uh, uh, the vehicles that we think will actually make a significant difference to reducing those short-term journeys. What do you make of, of the, the boom, Philip, in, in food delivery services and, 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 of course, product delivery services? So you, you, you think just, for example, of Uber Eats or Amazon or Deliveroo. Uh, is the boom of, of these services doing more harm than good or more good than harm? I think it's very difficult to say. I think anybody who thinks they have the definitive answer, then I'd love to hear from them. We, know, you know, because on the one hand, uh, you know, if you've got one one vehicle delivering to you know twenty households, um, that's significantly uh, environmentally better than twenty people getting in their car and driving to the local supermarket. However, the boon, as you said, in not just food deliveries, but just single use deliveries for everything from you know a pair of trousers through to a tv through to you know that evening's dinner um the scale of that has led to a massive massive increase not just in um emissions in certain uh urban environments where you know perhaps the less progressive companies are not using electric vehicles or alternatively fueled vehicles there's no doubt that's leading to significant um, emissions growth and also congestion, which, of course, is a secondary feature. And that's causing all sorts of issues with air quality in, in urban environments. So I, I think, to be honest, it's the jury's out as to whether or not at an aggregate level it's a better or worse environmental solution. What we can say is that it's a service that people want. So we have to find a way of delivering that um, to people in a way that is both um, environmentally uh, acceptable in a, in a long term sense and also um, economically acceptable to the user and to the operator. So it's a, it's a significant challenge. I think um, one of the areas where I don't think we've made anywhere near enough progress, for instance, is um, in... The development of alternatively fueled or electric vans compared to say passenger vehicles and of course most of the deliveries that you're seeing uh, to people's houses are actually in in vans we haven't mentioned in our discussion of mobility airplanes yeah talk us through the future of air travel and whether you think that we can reach a point where it can be done sustainably guilt-free People will always want to travel, whether that's to travel for um, hospitality reasons, holidays, or whether it's for business. So basically saying you shouldn't travel is really not the answer. Um, we may all need to travel less, but that's not the same as saying that we shouldn't be flying. Um, so I'm not in that camp at all. Um, so I think we'll always be flying. Clearly, there are... Um, 
technical solutions or technology solutions that are being developed. So alternative fuels, um, what are called sustainable fuels. Um, you may have seen in the um, press and the media last week a whole thing around the first um, hydrogen charged flight uh, that took place last week, 288 miles, I think it was. Um, that could be the future for um, cargo, uh, for instance, deliveries. Um, and certainly to your earlier point, um, uh, longer term uh, sustainable uh, urban deliveries could be could be using that because it's essentially like large drones. Um, but in terms of mass uh, air travel, um, I think we probably will need to travel less. But uh, I think the the challenge is really significant the, in terms of uh, the technical solutions. Um, but what is interesting is just to remind people that um, the vast majority of flights are taken by a relatively small number of people. So over 70 percent, I think the last statistic I saw, over 70 percent of flights worldwide are taken by 15 percent of the users. So there are massive um, users um, generating massive carbon footprints. Now, at the moment, they're not paying anything like the cost, the true cost of the environmental damage that they are causing. So it's not just it's not about um, the average family of four going on holiday to Mallorca. It's much more about the person who's perhaps going back and forth to France to a second home or uh, flying, uh, you know, more frequently through you know, business connections. But at the moment, they're paying no greater cost than somebody who's perhaps only flying once once a year. Um, and we also need to remember that 25, nearly 25 percent of people don't fly at all. So um, it's it's a long answer to a short question, but it is very complicated. There's no question about it. But I think finding simple solutions is, is not going to be easy. Briefly, what did you learn from almost two decades at the Energy Saving Trust? I mean, you were there, I think, from 2003 to 2020. Yeah, well, I think first thing is to say, looking back after 17 years or whatever it was in that job, the progress that we have made has been fantastic. There's no question about that because sometimes it's very easy to look at where you are and forget from where you've come. So we've made some very, very significant um, policy and practical steps on the road towards you know, a, a, a zero uh, emissions future. Um, I think two things I would say I've learnt. One is um, we are consistently um, very poor at... Um, consistent policy making um, it's you know the whole energy transition has been too much of political football for the last two decades and I think we we need to accept that the net zero uh, transition which is now set in law of course um, is not a party political issue it's an issue for not just the UK but globally so I think one thing I've learned is that You've got to have policies that are consistent and continuous. So uh, I'd love to see an end to some of the short term thinking that has marred the development of the zero tr uh, transmission um, of technology over the last two decades. Second point I'd make is the point that you raised, which is the absolute uh, importance of behaviour change, uh, because unless we have people we take people with us on this journey towards a, 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 a zero emissions future, it will it would neither be zero emissions and neither will it be a just transition. So I think behaviour change uh, allied to good, consistent policy making are the two things I think I take away from that time. On behaviour change, do you think it's going to have to be enforced by the states, not just in Britain, but around the world? Or do you think it can still happen organically, given we are seriously running out of time. Uh, I think we will have to up the ante, both uh, in terms of the carrots that we offer people in order to adopt the right sorts of behaviours. 
um, on the one hand. So I can see the development of, you know, much more sophisticated use of fiscal incentives, whether that's through the tax system um, or whether that's through the planning system, for instance, to encourage people to invest in the right sort of technologies in their homes and businesses. But equally, Matthew, I think you're absolutely right. I think we we are approaching the stage where um, we will see a greater use of mandatory powers in order to insist um, that certain technologies, uh, certain uh, behaviours um, are, you know, frank, frankly, uh, outlawed. Uh, and whether that's um, through uh, phasing out of technologies like fossil fuel uh, vehicles, uh, you know, two decades ago, we would have never thought that was possible politically. But clearly, that stage is now, that's been passed. And we will no doubt be fa facing future similar hurdles in the future. So more incentives on the one hand, because that's always a, a, a good thing to do. But equally, it has to be backed up with some harder edged uh, mandatory policies. And just time for, for one takeaway from your experience on the board of the Renewable Energy Association. A uh, thing that I think everybody in the renewables family has learnt, sometimes um, not quickly enough, is that there is no one single bullet, there is no one single technology, renewable or otherwise, that will lead us to where we need to be in terms of the zero emissions future. All of the technologies, whether they be hydrogen, whether they be solar, wind, uh, energy efficiency, electric vehicles, they all have a really, really important part. And I'm glad to see that, you know, one of the things that the REA has really been at the forefront of is just persuading people, persuading governments that actually it's not either or, uh, it's all of the above. We, we, we need to make progress on all of these technologies in, uh, in order to, to deliver on the zero emissions future that we, we all hope and agree we need. I've got three more concluding questions. One for government, one for business leaders and one for the rest of us. And we have to be brief because we're running out of time. If you were Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, what would you do if you could click your fingers to change things or to accelerate things? What would be your priorities? My priorities would be uh, to start with some fairly basic things like energy efficiency, um, because that's the simplest no regrets policy. So I would create a policy framework of at least a decade long to encourage um, both individual householders and businesses to take up what is, frankly, the easiest, uh, as I say, no regret solution for um, reducing emissions. What's your message to business leaders watching this? Can they make serious money in the immediate future, do you think, in the renewables area, in fighting climate change rather than contributing to it? Yeah, I personally think that my message to business leaders would be you actually represent the opportunity for the future, both for your businesses, your staff, um, your customers, there are some fantastic commercial opportunities out there, some of which are already being realised. Um, and this isn't about a green future. This is, this is about a sustainable net zero future that I think the private sector has an absolutely uh, massive responsibility uh, to take forward. And so just to, to conclude, absolutely, finally, given we've talked about the importance of behavioural change, What's your message to the rest of us in our everyday lives? My message would be, however small some of the uh, changes that you can make in your d daily lives, whether that's, you know, in what you do at home, how you travel and get to work, um, what you do when you're at work, all of those things, they may seem very small, but actually collectively they can create a momentum that encourages uh, everybody else to, to contribute. And I think that, along with government policy and business following on behind, that will lead us to where we need to be in terms of the net zero future. Philip Selwood, thank you so much for your time. OK, thanks very much, Matthew.